Folks, we have finally made it to the main event of the morning here, and it is none other than Jay Ward. And just a little bit about Junius Jay Ward. He's a celebrated poet and the author of Sing Me a Lesser Wound by Bull City Press and his latest, which is called Composition by Button Poetry. He's a national poetry, poetry slam champion, an individual world poetry slam champion, and not to mention Charlotte's inaugural poet laureate. Uh, so that is an amazing honor as well. I mean, he's attended uh, conferences all over the world. He's been featured at so many convenings. His poems can be found in tons of you know, reviews, the Columbia Journal, the uh, Diagram, uh, elsewhere. I mean, I could go on and on, but what I really want to say is that he's one of our favorite collaborators. He's always a yes, right? Like, he always wants to step up and bring his gifts into any conversation or convening that we're doing. And uh, we're just really grateful to call him a friend and a collaborator. And so, ladies and gentlemen, here to speak to us on our monthly theme of touch, please welcome the one and only Jay Ward. Come on up, Jay. My father passed away when I was 21 years old. And I found myself constantly writing a poem about my final moments with him. What I should say is, I wrote many, many poems about that moment. Poems that were meant to be uh, exploratory or celebratory, or meant to excavate, excavate, or meant to write on something totally new like balloons, or like messages to a younger self, all morphed into poems about that moment. In the hospital room, just the two of us, me holding his hand, whispering I love you, confident that he could not hear me, him squeezing my hand in response. What I'm saying is that every poem felt woefully inadequate, unsuccessful. I kept writing over and over essentially the same poem because I could not say what the poem needed me to say. There was a gap between what I was willing to explore and what I was willing to admit. And I needed those things to touch. Uh, this is probably one of the most recognizable paintings in the world. It's also one of the most replicated paintings of all time, including countless parodies. It's a fresco painting by Michelangelo in the 1500s, and it adorns the ceiling of the Vatican Sistine Chapel. The creation of Adam depicts Adam on the left and God as an older white-haired man on the right. It's often lauded for its technical craft, its use of color. Many will talk about Michelangelo's expert knowledge of the human anatomy, They'll point out that the background encompassing God to the right uh, is the perfect model of the human brain and that God appears to be reaching out from the side of the brain that deals with creativity and intellect, thereby giving that gift to Adam. Or they could look at that same shape and point out that it could be a uterus with the dangling blue garment symbolizing a newly cut umbilical cord. They also point out that God is seen embracing a woman which could be Michelangelo's way of acknowledging women in the childbirthing process, even though he was commissioned to do this work about creation. All of those things might be true. The craft elements alone make this work astonishing, but there's one thing here that draws me every time, and I find it to be more compelling than any execution of technical craft. We notice here that God and Adam are reaching toward each other. Presumably, God will touch Adam to give him the spark of life except their hands do not touch. There is a small space between their fingers. What does it mean? For me, the painting appears to be in motion. Either they are moving toward each other or away from each other, meaning the gift of life has either already been given or we are in a snapshot of time just before Adam fully receives that gift. My mind has to know why Adam and God's finger do not touch. My mind will make up its own answers. My mind is compelled to explore every avenue. And so I gathered some possibilities from the truest and wisest artistic source known to the world today. The forum chat boards in the World Wide Web. And so here are some possibilities. The gap could symbolize the gap between God and men. It could be God waiting for us to complete the distance between the two. Or God's finger is straining to reach while Adam's finger is half-hearted. Perhaps this also illustrates that the chasm between them is both physical and conceptual. Or God's finger is accusing Adam and maybe therefore all of mankind. Maybe that accusation is a forethought of what Adam would later do to be banished. Or if the painting was before Adam was given life, maybe that explains the lackadaisical demeanor, the lifeless demeanor. 
If this was after he was given life, perhaps it signifies the ungrateful attitude or lazy attitude of humankind. My point with all of this is not religious at all. My point with all of this is, despite all the technical proficiency of craft, even with the expert use of color, even with the expert knowledge of the human anatomy, there is one thing here that draws me. There is one thing here for me that makes this painting a masterpiece. And it's this space, this space where they almost touch. This space makes us question everything. This space does not provide the answer. And so we subconsciously seek our own answer. It wills us forward. Imagine this same painting where the fingers do touch. Less mystery, less interpretation, less journey for the audience. I kind of tongue in cheek earlier referred to these as experts, the, the forum boards, but I really don't care as much about uh, expert opinion when it comes to art, not always, because at least at the moment that it's being consumed, the only thing that matters is the individual reader or listener or audience member, how they interpret it, how it moves them, how it might touch in them. So this piece of art, the question of touch brings tension and drives our interest. Some of you may have seen the show, maybe. Uh, some believe it to be one of the greatest television series of all time, based on the novels by George R.R. R. Martin, Game of Thrones. In this picture, you see the entire family, Ned, Catelyn, Rob, Sansa, Arya, Bran, and Rickon Stark. This is actually a screenshot from season one, episode one, and it is the last time that you see them all on the screen together at the same time, because by episode two, the tension starts with the separation of the family, everyone going in different directions for different reasons. There are many, many, many plot lines that run through this show, but the tension that drives the narrative is the family's relentless drive to be together again and our desire to see them reunited. There are many times throughout its eight seasons that the family, that the members just barely miss each other. They almost touch. It's not until the first episode of the final season that we see a true reunion for the Stark family. And I won't say anything more than that in case you haven't seen it and in case you want to binge it over the next few weekends. But again, what I'm saying is in this piece of art, the question of touch brings tension and drives our interest. Uh, even if you are not familiar with hip hop or the latest hip hop artist, you probably have heard the name Kendrick Lamar. If you have not, here's a quick introduction via a song called Sing About Me, I'm Dying of Thirst. In the first verse, a friend of Kendrick's dies by gun violence. The verse is told from the perspective of that friend's brother. Revenge and the cyclical nature of this kind of violence is the backdrop for the song. In this verse, the brother asks Kendrick to sing about what happened, to let the world know. He says, and I love you because you love my brother like you did. Just promise me you'll tell this story when you make it big. And then we hear the chorus for this part of the song. When I shut off and it's my turn to settle down, my main concern, promise that you will sing about me. Promise that you will sing about me. On a previous project titled Section 80, Kendrick rapped about a girl named Keisha. The second verse of this song is told from the perspective of Keisha's sister. She's upset with Kendrick for revealing intimate details about her sister's life. She says, my sister died in vain, but what point are you trying to gain? And later says, and if you have an album date, just make sure I'm not in the song. We now see the reason for the song title, or the first half, Sing About Me, but we also see the tension build, the two things that do not touch. Kendrick being told by a very important person in his life, connected to a traumatic event with one of his best friends, to memorialize this event in song, but also being told by someone else that he's wrong for doing so, by the person directly harmed by the same act. So we see two very different lines of thought and Kendrick caught in the middle. What will he do? How will he react? What is the right thing to do? In the third verse, Kendrick reckons with survivor's guilt, with his own death, and whether he has the right to tell these stories. I suffer a lot and every day the glass mirror gets tougher to watch. He addresses the perspectives of both of the earlier verses. And you're right, your brother was a brother to me, and your sister's situation is the one that pulled me in a direction to speak on something that's realer than the TV screen. By any means, wasn't trying to offend or come between her personal life. I was like, it needs to be told. 
He then questions what would happen if he didn't continue rapping, didn't tell these stories. He likens it to cursing 20 generations after her soul. He says, I count lives on these songs and hope that at least one of you will sing about me when I'm gone. Kendrick is accepting this role where he feels the greater good is to tell the truth, to share these stories in the hopes that the community will benefit in the long run, avoiding the pitfalls that he and many around him have fallen into, even if it means he's seen as the villain by some. He's making a choice. Up until this moment, we've heard the hook, promise that you will sing about me from the earlier perspectives in the song, but now we're made to hear it from Kendrick himself. The song is not telling us that he made the right or wrong choice, or even that it's resolved in a way that Kendrick himself doesn't continue to question. He does. In fact, the end of the verse is, am I worth it? Am I putting enough work in? The fourth verse, I know you're asking me how many verses is it? This is actually a 12-minute song. It's, it's like this epic journey in the album, and it's, it's positioned right in a place where it can pivot, where the album can become something different. This fourth verse illustrates what happens when things almost touch. This verse is separated from the earlier verses by silence and a skit. And the skit explores vengeance and the choice that Kendrick has to make that could repeat the same cycle of violence that took the life of his friend. Here's the full chorus for the second part of the song. Tired of running, uh, tired of hunting, uh, my own kind, but we're tired of nothing. Uh, tired of steady screeching, the driver is rubbing, uh, hands on the wheel, uh, who said we wasn't? Uh, dying of thirst, uh, dying of thirst, uh, dying of thirst. This verse and the ones that follow, highlight Kendrick's preoccupation with death and vengeance and sparks a realization of what he thinks is truly killing his community. This represents a turning point in the album, but also in his life. It's the moment he would turn to his career instead of to the cycle of violence and revenge in his neighborhood. We're tired of running. We're dying of thirst. What does that mean? I won't spoil that part of it for you. It is a 12 minute journey. I invite you to listen to the song uh, to find out that meaning. But there's more here, of course, than just compelling lyrics. If you listen to the song from the beginning, knowing that the full title is Sing, me, Sing About Me, I'm Dying of Thirst, then a natural tension emerges. Uh, it's clear from the beginning why Sing About Me is in the title. What's not initially clear is what does dying of thirst mean and how does it relate to Sing About Me? The beat goes silent. There's a skit. There's literally a gap between promise that you will sing about me promise that you will sing about me and uh, dying the thirst uh, dying the thirst uh, dying the thirst so on the other side of that gap is a completely different beat a different feel the first part of the song feels contemplative and interrogative the second part of the song feels urgent and desperate and our mind is clamoring to close that gap we want those narratives to touch uh, a teacher workshop one of those poems about my father that I talked about earlier. And he asked me a simple question. How many times can you remember holding hands with your father as a kid? I drew a blank. Because for me, the question brought up happy images of childhood, but no real images, no real memory of hand holding. It brought up the realities and nuances of Southern masculinity, perhaps toxic during that time period, and where holding hands, even as father as son, would fit into that. It reminded me that the two preceding years before my dad got sick were wrought with the growing pains of a dad-son relationship. Arguments, contention, resistance, guilt. He gave me the following assignment. Write a poem describing three times where your hands or your father's hands touched or almost, you almost held hands. End with the image of you holding his hand in the hospital. It took me years to shape that poem into something that quenched my need to write so many versions of it. Or what I should say is something that finally connected the two things I needed to confront, grief and guilt. And that presumably would free my mind and heart to explore other topics. This is the first page of that poem. Reading down the left side is a poem of fact. Reading down the right side is a poem of image. Reading across and you get the full poem or the whole picture. This is a contrapuntal of sorts, which is a musical term for two or more melodies played at once. Notice there's a gap, tension between the left column and the right column. Our minds want to sort this, to make sense of it. Our minds want those columns, want my hands and my father's hands to touch. 
in Michelangelo's work, the question of touch, the space in between, brings tension and drives our interest. In Game of Thrones, the space between the characters, our needs to see them, touch, drives the narrative. For Kendrick's song, how the stories relate and touch each other is what compels the listener. In the first two examples, there was an element of physical touch depicted between characters. In the third example, the touch that our minds searched for was not physical, it was one, the connection between Kendrick's desire to tell a story and the philosophical question of whether he had the right to do so. And two, a thematic connection between two intriguing but very separate titles. And what I mean to say here is that I am not exclusively speaking of touch as the more insular act of connection that we literally create on screen or on canvas or on wax or on paper or in dance or in craft. I am speaking to of how our art can move or touch our audience. As audience, what we learn from this is that we are driven by the need to touch, to understand, to be in community, to be part of something larger, to find meaning. And we do that through our art. We hopefully want to, but assuredly need to, leap across generation gaps, wealth gaps, race and equity gaps, gender gaps, fill the gaps, touch each other in a way that leads to larger and stronger community. Touch each other in a way that leads to answering the unanswerable and saying the unsayable. To touch is to explore the human condition. As creatives, what we learn is to leave room for touch, to leave room for questions, leave space to allow for motion, motion that brings us closer or questions why we're so far apart. This is accomplished in part by excellence in craft, but as I said before, I am less concerned with technical precision and satisfying the experts in the room as I am with touch, with what is accomplished by allowing our audience to fill in the blanks, Give us a question, give us a need, even if it takes years, give us something that reaches towards or pulls away from touch. Parents, siblings, partners, old friends, an arts community that will accept us, an arts organization that will fund us, our desire to be free in our art versus our desire to be compensated. The silos we find ourselves in versus the equitable access that we want. Our knowledge of what we know to be right versus our memory of something we've done. Acceptance, forgiveness, self-love. What are the things in our lives that currently do not touch? Creatives, in your practice, show us what matters most. Give us the choice of what happens next. Push us, pull us. That is what it means to 